Rahatan, Rakadun, Akuloi Manch, Fort Mahavi Manch. This is whistling. I've been learning my language for almost three years, between two and three years. Um, I'm coming to you from Fort Mojave today. Um, one of the things, um, this is Aldi and all of the people here. Um, I mean, it's nice to look out and see a lot of friends. Uh, Susan Penfield, Ophelia, uh, Andrea, um, some people we've met along the way from our tribe. Um, we say uh, so they're friends of ours. Um, we don't have a PowerPoint today. I, I sat down with uh, one of my elders, um, my teacher, Hubert McCord, and he said, I tried to show him some of my slides, and he said, just, just go and, and tell him the way I would tell him. And, um, and so I think he'd probably start off with a joke. And it's usually, he'd usually tell you a dirty joke, but um, I'll save you that expense. But um Ajkortanam, so a long time ago, um Satamuik um Quinumake, so an Indian from another tribe, uh Matancharon, he's from up north. Uh he came down to Fort Mojave and uh you know we're part of the human language family. And he came down and he was selling pies. And he said, um, you know, I've got this really good pie, it's apple pie all the way from Washington. And uh he said this to a Mojave man, and the Mojave man said you know, we, we don't want any pie. We, we already have the best pie around here. And the guy thought, oh, you know, you live out in the middle of the desert and you've got good pie out here? And he's like, well, you know, I've got strawberry pie, the best strawberry pie around. Uh, it's the strawberries, we picked them ourselves in Oxnard on our way down. And the Mojave man said, you know, no, we don't need that pie. We, we really do have the best pie around. And so, you know, the guy asked him, he said, what do, you, what do you mean you're out in the middle of the desert? What do you have, what kind of pie do you have? And he said, oh, we have walla pie, yava pie, <laughs> soup pie, and you just can't beat that kind of pie. <laughs> so, I see we've got a friend there in the back, so shout out to him. Yeah, so, um, for us, we're a fairly new program. Uh, we started, we just kind of scraped ourselves together at the end of um, 2009. So it was in October, November, December of 2009 is when we started. So we're still a fairly young program. And I remember right at the beginning, we spoke with Lucille Watahamaji. She was one of, geez, probably about 40 people whose doors I went begging at. I just Googled people and we started calling them left and right to start our program. But one of the first things she told me is she said, okay, I'm glad you guys are starting this program, but just the, the best, advice I can give you is that you need to be like the turtle, Kapet Yuvek. You have to be like the turtle, you have to have a hard back. And we, at Fort Mojave, we have big backs, so you know we've got that part down. But I think that was probably the best lesson I could have had because we had a really rough start our first year, just trying to get on the same page. Um, you know, language is so emotional for all of us, our elders. It was tough for them to, to be willing to put themselves out there. And we know that our communities, we, we have enough failures in our communities. Our kids have enough failures in our communities. And so for us to put our foot forward and to open ourselves up, to open our hearts up, it's a difficult thing because we, we can't afford any more failures. And so that first year for us was all about getting on the same page with our administration, you know, who've been great in supporting us, yet they expected things overnight. You know, okay, you've got the elders, you've got how many? Four? Great, they speak. Okay, now you have them teach you to speak and now you can teach everybody else to speak. You know, and that was kind of people's mentality. Um, you know, we had learners start to come out, they'd come to a meeting, and if they weren't leaving with the language, they'd leave disappointed. You know, people wanted it overnight. 
because we wanted it so badly, not because we were lazy, but because it was so important to us. And so after that first year, um, the first two years really, um, we finally started to build a family. And but one of the problems for us was as many as many models as there are, and I think April spoke to this, and I think Stacy spoke to this as well. Um, of all the models there are, it's tough sometimes to find your model. For us, we're, we're not ready to jump into an immersion situation. We're not ready to teach it in the colleges yet. We're learning from three elders, and we have a very small group of people who are learning and who are stepping up and saying, okay, I'm willing to bear the brunt of the language. I'm willing to carry it. And so for us, that was maybe one of the biggest hurdles, to, to look at all these models and to see what everybody's doing that's kind of the blessing and the curse. You see all the possibilities. And you think, oh, we need to do that, and we need to do that, and we need to do that, and we need to do that. And we started spreading ourselves thin. And what started happening is we started projects we weren't finishing. And we want to do this, we'll start this. Okay, let's go. And then we realized, okay, one person can't do that all by themselves, especially if that one person is doing 10 other things. Or those two people can't do it because they're also doing these other things. And so what we realized is we had to find our own model. We had to take the things that appealed to us from these different programs and we had to turn them around and we had to change them and make them ours. We had to make them Mojave because that's who we are. We are Mojave. You know? And so that was one of the things we did. And, and I think Andrew was talking a little bit about this um, with me earlier. We had to look around and see, hey, where are we? Who are we? What are the things we do that make us who we are? And so that's the approach we came to language with. And I think that's what everybody's been talking about here. It's not just language. We're not learning a foreign language. We're learning who we are again. We're learning how to, to, to be Mojave again. You're learning how to be the thing you were. For us, the most powerful phrase that we teach our learners is we say, Iwanch chokam. So we don't just say, I'm Mojave. What our elders teach our young kids is we beat it into our hearts. That's the kind of Mojaves we are. We're beating it back into our hearts. It's a physical thing. It's not just a language that floats around in the air and is written down on paper. And so, so for us, the language is, is bringing us back to who we are. Our, our speakers right now range in age, and, and we count, we have different counts, I think, on different reservations, but I wor I've worked for the last three years with four elders, fluent speakers, and we just lost one in December. Uh, she would have been 92. And so we're working with three speakers right now. And they, they range, they start at 80 years old, which means they, have, they didn't pass the language down to their kids. So for the last 80 years, our language has been very quiet. Very quiet other than being spoken between our elders. So you figure it's like a time capsule. That language is holding so much of, of who we are, of our culture, of our history, our identity. And so you figure, how have we made it for the last 80 years? How have we been Mojave for the last 80 years? Because we have a casino? Because we, we still live at the foot of Vikwame? You know, what, are, what is it that made us Mojave these last 80 years? Because what we're realizing is as we come back to the language, we're finding ourselves again. And so for us, the language, it's, it's like everybody said, it's more than language. It's our very identity, it's who we are. I'm trying to, I'm trying to go off of these little cards here. And I've just like skipped like 30 things. So um, we're gonna kind of go. So, so one of the things we did, and I think everybody's doing this, is um, when we saw some of these models, these big things, yeah, we wanna do this, we wanna do that. What we really had to do is we had to slow down. We had to slow down and we had to say, what are the things that we need? We can't do all of these things, but what are the things that we need that we can put our learners in a position to succeed? Even if it's starting small, starting and saying, hey, for the very first time, you're going to quit calling yourselves, and, and someone, I think Daryl Baldwin spoke to this earlier, you're going to quit calling yourself Native Americans or indigenous. Or I, I was just in Victoria, and they were so proud that they say, a, a white woman told me this, she said, oh, we don't say Indians or Native Americans, we say First Nations, as if that were the answer to everybody's problems. Oh, first, oh okay, First Nations, well, well that changes everything. 
But what we're, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, who are you? Hamakav. That's who we are. So giving our kids that opportunity to call themselves by the thing that they were very first called, the, the name they were given by the creator. Even Mojave. We're not really Mojave. That's the Spanish name because they couldn't pronounce our name. So Hamakav. So even saying, being able to call themselves by the very first thing they were called, that opens a door to their identity that they didn't have before. And, and you see it, you see it well up in, in, in these learners, in the adults, in the kids. Because finally, they're becoming who they were meant to be, who the Creator first set them out to be. And so that's really important for us. Um, with, the, with the smaller goals, um, one of the things that we did that, that we feel is very special, is very important, is that we built a core group around our elders. And so what that did was, instead of us having to drag our language into a school, into a school setting where it hasn't ever been before, and it, remember, we're just three years old. We're just starting to do this. What we did was we built a core group. We have eight adult learners that we built around our speakers. And so instead of taxing them and saying, hey, you have to learn the language, we're saying, hey, take care of your family. Take care of your elders. This is your grandmother. This is your aunt. This is your great aunt. So all you have to do is take care of them. And so what started happening is our elders are speaking the language. And so we're around taking care of them. And, and so what we've done is we've created the most natural language transmission, the most traditional language transmission experience that we can because we've built this core group around them. And so we spend all our time with them. We spend all our time talking with them telling stories, sharing meals, taking them to the grocery store, you know, taking them to the, I, you know, night, or they get a phone call from the ER and someone needed stitches and there we go to pick them up. You know, we, we've just kind of rebuilt the family structure around our elders and that's been really important because what it, what it meant is we can take the work element out of it. And so we're not simply working. It's not, hey, you're here to learn your language. It's, hey, you're here to be a Mojave. You're here to take care of your family. And that's one of the ways we've been able to transmit the language is it quit being work for them. It quit being a lesson. Because we all know the relationship we have with the education system. And, as, and for our community still, as soon as you put it into a traditional ec academic educational structure, we're not quite sure of it anymore. We just don't trust it anymore. And so we had to pull it out of that, we had to yank it out of that and put it back into a family, a family structure. Another thing for us that, that we feel is really important, um, and some people have talked about the emotions involved with language, but we let our, we let our elders and we let our learners be angry. I, you know, I think that's probably one of the most important things. Be mad. We don't have our language. We're fighting for it. We're fighting to, to not drink. We're fighting to not do drugs. We're fighting to, to raise our kids to stay together as families. We're fighting to figure out how to say the things that our ancestors have said for years. We're fighting for our land. We're fighting for our water. Why? And so we, we constantly remind our young learners about this because we think it's important. One of the things that, that I think happens when we're talking about language is we try and sanitize it. We say, oh, the boarding schools did it. The government did it. Oh, you know, these things happened. And now we're moving on. We're healing. Well. There's a part of us that we might heal, meaning we're still gonna function and move forward, but there's a part of us that it's never going to be the same again. And we think that that's important to remind our young people about that. We let them get fired up. We let them say what it is that, that's burning in them because that fire ignites in other areas and for us it ignites in language. So rather than let our kids be upset and, and unsure of who they are and, and why this is, we, we tell them, this is why it happened. Now, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to transfer this and turn it into excitement, turn it into energy, turn it into to your identity? Who are you? What are you gonna do about it? But we give them ways to do it. So it's, it's not that we're trying to incite violence and riot, but what we're doing is we're inciting that same passion and we're letting them put it into to language. One of the things that saved me from the reservation was basketball because I was able to take that frustration, to take the things I was seeing, to take the things that I was hearing, and I was able to, to put, put it into basketball and turn it into to something great that, that got me my education, that took me around the world. 
And it's no different with language. It's part of who they are. The one of the reasons why it's good as basketball is because, you know, we Mojaves have these little bony legs, but they're good to get us up and down the court. You know, it was the same thing. We tell our kids, it's in you. This language is in you. You don't even have to go far to get it. You just have to take the time and light that, light that fuse. And so that's one of the things that we do is we, we let our, our elders be emotional, we let them be angry, and we try and have them turn that around into, you know, our kids get in trouble. You know, our kids are not perfect. But now what if we give those kids something positive to put that energy into, to put that anger and frustration into? And for us, it's been language and it's been a really good experience. And, and again, that's why one of, one of the things our elders said, don't whisper quietly that you're Mojave. That's why we beat it into our hearts. It's part of this, this mentality we have. We say that we're, gonna, we're reclaiming the word warrior. So think, for, for us, Kwanami. Kwanami is our word for warrior. So Kwanamich Ilu. That's how I would say I am a warrior. What, what is your word for warrior? Deasi. 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 Like Oprah. Deasi. Deasi. What are some other words for warrior? Shamaganish. Shamaganish. Yo. Warriors, other words? I'm going to look at that. Any other warrior? See, for us, our elders didn't want to let us use that word. And they said, one, it only applies to men. Only men were warriors. And then they also said, there are no more warriors, is what they told us. But we fought for that word. We kept bringing it back up. We kept asking them again. Say, hey, we're fighting every day for this. It's not easy. And finally, after about two years, one of our elders, because we make posters, we said, well, what is the next thing you want us to tell people? And he said, I think, I think they're ready. So, Kwanamich Iduchim, is we are warriors, is the word that he gave them. You know, and, and for us, that's really important for us to give that back to our kids, especially our young men, our teens. And I think our teens are probably one of the groups that have been the most underestimated of all our learners. We all focus on language nests and the babies, yet we have these teens flailing. And for us, our teens have been our fastest learners. And we've given them that word back. They're warriors again. They have something to fight for. And it's who they are. It's their identity and their language. And so for us, that's the way we look at it now. We're warriors. Kwanamich iluchim. We're warriors, we're fighters. And so that's been a concept that's, that's worked really good with our kids. And it's, it's again, one that swells them up. You know, they lift up their heads, they're proud of it. And, and our men, believe it or not, and our elders are shocked by it, but our young men, 15 to 19, are our fastest learners. They're the ones that come to the meetings. They're the ones that wanna know more. They come and they ask questions. And for us, that's, that's been a big eye opener because we always thought, Oh, there's not, you know, our kids, they're getting in trouble. For us, our biggest learners are the ones that we had the least confidence in. The ones who are teaching their kids, who are making it a point to, to show up to bring their kids, are our men and women who've been in and out of prison. They're the ones who want something better for their kids. So that's where we're putting our, our efforts. That's where we're not ignoring them anymore. Um, at, the, at the request of our elders, we're going in on our Monday evening's White Bison group which is the, you know, N-A-A-A for, for natives. And so we're going in and that's what, I mean, our elders are willing to put this anywhere and everywhere. And that's where we need it. That's where our people need it the most. And so these are just some of the things that, that we hope are helping us to be these new, these new warriors. Um, with our kids, one of the things we try and do is we try never to make our kids choose. Never make them choose between language or something else. And for us, it's something simple as not holding a language class the same night our kids have a basketball game. Just little simple things that sometimes, you know, in the beginning we weren't thinking about. But right now, rather than give our kids an opportunity to say no, we say yes for them ahead of time. So there's, it's always a yes. They don't have to choose. 
It's the same thing with me, with, with writing, with all these other things I do. For a while, I wasn't carrying it with me. And then my elder said, you know, go. Go, but, but take your language with you. You don't have to leave it here. And so that's one of the things we're trying to show our kids. There are so many truths that we've all learned to hold as we, as we move forward. We don't make them choose between religious beliefs and tribal beliefs. And that's one of the things we've learned coming back through, through the land. We don't use the word myth anymore because for so long our kids have heard, oh, that's your creation myth. That's, that's the story that they say happened. You know, and for us, the most eye-opening thing was taking a group of kids out on the river and showing them the course of a river, the story where the landmarks matched the story, where they could see where the giant stepped. They could see where he was slain. And one of the kids said, so did this, this really happen? It happened. Look, I can see it. And you hear them talking. And like our elders said, yes, this really happened. This is how you got here. And they say, well, what about what, about what we're taught in church? And he said, that happened too. And when you think about it, that's the way we've lived all the way through. And so for us, the language, it has to be something our kids can carry both in both hands. We're not telling them one is better than the other. We're saying they're both a part of you. And so that's been a, an important thing for us to kind of keep that, keep that in mind. Um, and like I think, like April was saying with some of the groups, all the things we've been, we try everything. We try anything. We teach lullabies in Build-A-Bears. You know, we record them into the paw and we give them to the kids at daycare. Um, I have a dog who speaks Mojave. So all his commands are in Mojave and our kids learn from him so quickly. So, you know, they learn all of the things, sit down, and he does tricks. So he can turn a circle, he can shake, he can do all of these things, but all in Mojave. And, you know, so that's a lesson, teaching your dog. You know, we'll, we're willing to try anything and everything. And sometimes they don't work but we move on to the next thing. Um, so I, I think just for us, part of the thing, the way we try and think about ourselves as new learners of the language, things that are different is, is one, we come home. You know, we leave and we go to school, but we come home because we know we've got something that our people need. And we know that some of the reasons why we've been successful are because of the way we were raised at home, those values. So I think that's probably one of the most important things is that we go places and we learn and we come back home. And also, we're not afraid to collaborate. And, and we don't just say it. How many times have you said, oh, yeah, we'll work with you, or yeah, we'll do this. But we really, we really collaborate. You know, we say, hey, what have you got that you can help us with? And we also say, hey, I've got something I can help you with. One of the things we're hoping will sweep through the whole human language is our talking dictionary. And we're building one for Peach Springs right now for the Wallapai Nation. And we're hoping we can get Maricopa on board because for us, we've lost so many words and so many phrases and so many place names. If we can get everybody to document these things, we can start sharing. Because it's not often that, you know, um, Kelly Washington is a, a good language friend of mine. He's been a good mentor. They already left, though, because they're cheap. But um, <laughs> you said they were tired or something. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, I told them next time they fight with the Yumas, we're not going to help them, so. <laughs> but, you know, we call each other and say, hey, my elders want to know how to say this word. And, and often it'll jog their memory just hearing. Or they want to know what's the name of that, that mountain there that's shaped, you know, like a tooth. And so we help each other out. And I think probably something that, that, we, that I, maybe I learned in basketball um, is just that being willing to try everything, there, there's some fine lines, you know, we, you don't waste a lot of energy. Um, you know, it's not just a, I know up north, maybe, maybe up high in Navajo country, they just run around on the court a lot. But, um, you know, when you're playing basketball, you've got four quarters to last. You don't just run around wild. You run, but you run with a purpose. You move with a purpose. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing with language. We're willing to try everything. We're willing to put our energy into everything. But at the same time, we're not, you know, you can't just run around and, and give your elders opportunities where they feel like they're failing. So we put in the late work, we figure out what's going to work, and we try it. And I, I think I'll just close with something that um, one of my, my elders always tells me, because I always say, oh, don't worry, everything, everything will be okay. It's going to turn out okay. And finally he said, um, he said, you know, Natalie, I wish you'd quit saying that. And I said, well, well why? You know, I'm just trying to 
be positive. He goes, you know what? It might not be okay. He's like, it, it, it might not be okay in the end. And he says, Matahai bunu vivaka. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna, the wind's gonna blow, but you're still gonna be here. Kuval bunu vivaka. It's gonna rain, but you're still gonna be here. You know, mapotahanam bunu vivaka. It's gonna, the wind's gonna blow real hard, but you're still gonna be here. And he's like, and then you're just gonna do the next best thing after that. And so, if, if whatever we do, if it doesn't work, we're just here ready to kind of do the next thing. And I think as, as learners, that's probably the best thing that, that we can do. And so, you know, we're ready for the next thing. And, and thank you for having us. We're glad we, you know, we could share some of this with you.